So I had some questions about a homework assignment. Homework assignment was trying to run a hello module that you defined. A couple of things I want to show you about idle. If you go into the options, configure idle, and then go to general, there's a couple of nice things that you might care about. One is, what's it going to do when it starts up? Is it going to run the editor, or is it going to run the shell? This is the shell, you know, whenever you see those three errors. Uh, excuse me, arrows. If you're in the shell, do not enter your code there unless you absolutely need to be doing it. Why? Because it's not going to be able to save it. You can't save from this window. If you do, all you're going to do is get a log of what happened. It's not actually a coding window. It's an interactive thing where you can enter some commands and watch the responses, but it's not a coding window. So if you feel like it, you could say open the edit window whenever you launch Python. And that's kind of nice. The other thing you might want to do is if you get tired of it saying, you know, do you wish to save? Yes, no. You could just say save automatically. Don't prompt when I'm going to run it. Seemed like there was a third one I wanted to show you, but I don't recall what it was. If you feel like messing around for hours with your colors, you can go to highlights and uh, change the format. Like maybe you don't want the comments to be in red, maybe you want them to be in purple, right? Or maybe, you know, strings should be some other color other than green, whatever. There are built-in themes. There's one called classic, and there's one called dark. Now, I'm not going to put dark up here. Some of it's easier to read, but red text is not. And it could be if I tweaked it, I could finally get it to look good for y'all. But I'm just going to go ahead and leave it on classic. What does idle new look like? Eh. It's the same, I think. Maybe you can make some changes to it if you wanted to. I wouldn't spend all day during class messing with that, but it's something that you could do. I don't see anything else here that I want to mention. Something called extensions that I haven't looked at yet. I just noticed it. I want to try to learn about it. Okay. So the assignment, or part of it, was to define a function. Hopefully you know what a function is. If you don't know what a function is, it looks like this. I'm going to go ahead and do file, new file, and I'm going to type it in, but then I'll probably close it, or at least I'm going to go back to the shell. And why not save it? So anyways, I'm going to save it to my favorite scripting directory. I don't know when idle stopped displaying my favorites here. I don't know how to get this back. I can always go to the desktop and save it. Alrighty, I guess I'll call it c.py because today is lecture C. Alright, to define a module in this language, you use DEF, that's the keyword. You give the module a name, like Bob. That's a pretty stupid name. And then it has to have parentheses and it has to have a colon. If it doesn't have all four of those components, the DEF, the name of it, parentheses and a colon, it's not going to work. Now, as always, anytime you have a colon, you're going to start tabbing afterwards. Python will consider it an error if you do not tab after a colon. Some languages use curly braces, not ours. So what's this one going to say? It's just going to print, I am Bob. Maybe I should have called it Groot and made it say I am Groot. Okay, so that's a function. When I run it, the code doesn't look like it does anything. Run module. Well, it did something. It defined a module, but I didn't call it. I think I need to douse the lights just a little bit more. When I want to invoke it, I do that. Now when I run it, and I'm hitting Control S, by the way, so that's why you're not seeing that Do You Wish to Save dialog. But I think I also checked that checkbox that said, do it anyways, do it automatically. <coughs> Don't prompt. And when I ran it, it does say, I am Bob. Well and good. So a module is a named chunk of code, right? It's a named section of code that you invoke by using its name. In this language, you can intermix your definitions and your code. Not all languages will let you do this, but if I wanted to define another one, yeah, why not GERD? 
define group. Print, I am group. And then when I want to invoke it, I'll do that. Now when I run it, it's going to say I am Bob. Then it's going to say I am group. Why? Because it invokes this module, and then it invokes this module. Now I don't usually recommend mixing your code and your module definitions like that. I recommend putting all the modules on the top. I undid that change. A module has to be defined before you can use it. If I tried to call root here, don't add this because it's not going to work. If I tried to call Groot here, it's not going to know what Groot is. Groot is not defined. Well, I defined it. Yeah, but you didn't define it before it was invoked. That's why I considered a good idea to put all the modules up near the top of the code and then all the code underneath it. Usually I'm going to stick to that. There may be times when I on the fly want to create a module underneath it. I'm calling them modules. I'm sorry. That's the fundamentals 113 term for it. We should be calling them functions because uh, that's what they're called in this language and in the vast majority of others. All righty, I only need to call Groot once. Well, what would happen if I called Groot twice? All right, it says, I am Bob, I am Groot, I am Groot, as we would expect. Okay, now part of the assignment was to illustrate that you can define your modules inside the shell. I actually kind of don't remember why I wanted to uh, show this. But what some folk were doing, the assignment had you try to call a hello module like that. Well, we hadn't defined the hello module yet. We would have to define it exactly the same way we did here with the DEF keyword. Now, if you mess up, if you make a typo in this mode, it's kind of a drag. You usually have to retype it. But anyways, define hello, parentheses in parentheses, print hello. Notice that it's tabbed over because we had a colon on the line. We could enter more code, but I'm not going to, so I'm going to hit enter a second time. Whoopsie, I did not mean to put that there. All right, now it didn't do anything. That's because the module is defined, just like when I defined Bob, but I didn't invoke it. Please stop calling it module, Jeff. Function. Just know that those terms are interchangeable, and uh, in fundamentals, you probably call them modules, so everybody knows what I mean, I hope. So if I want to call it, well, I'm going to call it, hello. No, that just gives me a hexadecimal number. That's not going to do it. I have to use the parentheses to invoke it. Now, you can define a module that accepts parameters. You define the module with arguments. The arguments are placed between the parentheses when you define it, and the parameters are what you pass to it when you invoke it. Now I'm going to close this for now. I'm going to write another one called hi, define hi, but it's going to take a parameter, in, short for name. And it's going to print hi, end quote, comma, in, in parentheses. Now when I try to call it, no longer is this going to work. It's a syntax error. Why? Because I've said that it has to have a parameter because I defined an argument there. What is an argument? An argument is a variable that's tucked away inside the parentheses of the function definition. If one is defined here, you better pass one in. Later on, we'll find out that that's not always true, but for now, we're going to accept that as true. All right. It said, missing one required positional argument. You're going to have to get good at interpreting these kind of terse messages. Now, in here, when I'm wandering around helping you all, you don't get much of a chance to figure that out, right? You kind of raise your hand, I come over and immediately fix it. See if you can fix it before I get over there. But, you know, it's the kind of thing you're going to have to figure out at home. But if you get stuck, take a picture of your screen. I'll give you a strong clue or tell you what you need to do. All right. I need to pass something in. I'm going to pass in my name. There we go. This is what's known as a parameter. 
the parameters of value that's going to fill in this argument so that we, the code will be able to print it out. And is this, all this considerably more advanced than Chapter 2 of the book? Yeah, but that's okay. You'll hit it in the book as well, and then you're going to know it twice as well, and I expect that you already hit it in fundamentals anyways. So these are modules. Now an interesting thing, at least in my <coughs> mind, is that once you run it, once you run the module, those functions remain in memory. Right? They call Bob. I know that Bob exists. Nothing undefined it. I see Groot, I see my high module, so I could call it right here, and it prints I am Bob. That won't work if I start fresh from a new shell. If I go to Python shell, it doesn't know what Bob and Groot and high are. <coughs> so, you know, if I type high, no, that's not going to work. If I type high like that, I type hi and pass in my name, right? You know, none of these are going to work because these modules are not defined. If I ran this again, right, run module, then they're defined and I could invoke them. But do you want to always run the code before you can call the modules from the shell? Well, we're not going to be doing that much from the shell anyways, but this is illustrative of a point. The point is that if you want to be able to invoke those modules, whoops, I didn't mean to run it. I accidentally, I actually meant to just go to Python shell. So what I did is I closed the shell. I don't know if you're catching what I'm doing. Here's the shell, I'm closing it so it starts fresh when I run another one. And there we go. Now I don't want to run it to load up these three modules in memory. Instead, I'm going to use an import. Now the name of this file is c.py, so I'm just going to import c. Now I'm typing a capital letter because that's what I did here, but I believe it'll work with a lowercase as well. Nope. Let's import C with an uppercase C. Well, what do you know? Alrighty. The reason why is because this is running in a different directory than what this is. And I'm not going to worry about fixing that. Just a sec. All right. If we want to see our current directory, we're going to import a library called OS. The library is one that's built into Python. So within the shell, I'm going to type import OS, import op operating systems, what OS stands for. Hopefully I'm not going to get an error because that library is default. It's native to the, life, to the Python install. And now I'm just going to type OS dot, and then I'm going to type in CWD, current work directory. So get CWD, parentheses, in parentheses. It's a function call, so I have to put the parentheses. And see what directory it's running in? It's running in the Python 37 directory. That's not going to help us much because this file is stored in my name, desktop, scripting, right? So if I did a save as and I save this into the Python 37 directory, I could get it to work. But I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be saving anything into the Python directory structures until I'm absolutely sure I know what I'm doing. But we can get that to work. We can get that import C to work. What we're going to do, keeping the C.py open, but go ahead and close your shell directory. File, new file. We're going to import C, and then we're going to call Bob. That's enough. Print done. Then I'm going to save this into the same directory as C.py. 
maybe I'm going to give it the very original name of c2.py. Now we're going to see something annoying when this happens. Tell you what, temporarily comment out Bob and comment out done before you run it. Then save it and run. Now they're both in the same directory. They're both in the scripting directory. So the import statement should not fail like it did from the shell. Alrighty, now when I imported it, what did, what did it do? It went off to the races and did all this stuff. Why is that? Because when it imported it, this is effectively what the import statement does. I really do need to go dim the lights. I'll do that. Is it copies all this stuff and pastes it right here, right? And then it finishes running. And well, all of these function invocations are already are in our code now. So if you're going to import a module, you really don't want to have any unindented code in it. All you want it to do is to define the functions, not to call them. So to kind of fix that, I think I'm just going to comment these guys out. Now is it going to print a darn thing? Pick a guess. No. Nah, because I don't have any unidentic code other than the import statement. So when it sucks all this code in, puts it in here, it still doesn't have any code to run. It just has module definitions. Yeah, as expected, it didn't do anything. It imported these modules. I could still call them from the shell. No, I couldn't. Huh. I'm not going to worry about why that failed. But I am going to uncomment these. Oh, and they're not going to work. That call to Bob is not going to work. My apologies. The reason why is when you import, well, I'll just show you. It doesn't know what Bob is. Bob is not defined. Oh, yeah, it's defined. But the problem is, is it's expecting us to prefix the name of the function with the name of the library. If I do c.bob, now it's going to work. Okay. What if I didn't want to have to prefix all my modules with c. I can use an alternate syntax of the import statement in order to get them in in such a way that c. is not necessary. I feel like doing that. So I'm going to get rid of the c. I'm going to get rid of import C, and I'm going to type from C import Bob. This is a different syntax. So instead of doing import C, which brings in everything in the code, this searches the code specifically for this module, and hopefully only this module. We could uncomment this stuff and see if that's the case. But now when I run it, it did run. I did not have to put the C dot here because of this syntax. Now what if I call Groot from here? I'm going to put Groot here above my print done. Is that going to work or is it not? And the answer is it's not going to. Why? Because I imported Bob, but I did not import Groot. Now, I could do import Bob, import Groot, import high, and if I had 100 other functions defined in this file, I could import them all. Or I can use a syntax that will import them all for me rather than doing them, you know, individually. Here's the syntax for getting all of the functions in a file. From C, import star. You're probably familiar with what the star means, right? If I come up here... And um, I'm going to run a command prompt by hitting Windows R, typing in CMD. And then if I do DIR, you know, it gives me everything. But if I do DIR L star, it only gives me the ones that start with L. So the star is the wild card. I don't know if I could do import B star and have it bring in Bob. I'm not sure if that's a syntax error or not. I'm going to undo that. Yeah, that's a syntax error. Anyways. Now that we have imported all the functions here, 
it's successfully able to run. Now I'm wondering if it will ignore this code. I'm going to uncomment this stuff. Run it. And it did go ahead and give me, you know, the stuff that was in here. Even though I told it to only bring in one function, it went ahead and brought in all the code. I don't know what to think about that because we saw that when we tried to call Groot, it didn't work. Well, what if I change that back? You don't have to do this because I'm going to wind up undoing this. Nope. If you have any undented code in your function, in your file, if you import it, regardless of the syntax, it's going to execute the unindented statements. So, we learned something. Your professor learned something. Alrighty, as far as notes go, I'm going to make a little note to myself about that. We've already seen that this is a single line comment. But I can create a multi-line comment by using um, three quotes, three apostrophes, or three double quotes. Use import live name to bring the functions to print. from that library into your current. DUI file. You have to invoke the functions by prefixing with the name of the library. Example. If we did import live name, we would have to use live name dot function name. If you don't want to use the prefix, use this syntax from live name import star or the specific module name. I cannot type. Or from live name import func name. One thing that kind of annoys me is I cannot do from c.py. You know, these modules are defined in something called c.py. Why can't, why can't we import from it? It doesn't want the extension. And that's similar to some other languages like Java. Not similar to C++. So if you've taken one of those two languages, just know. Anyways, no extension. All right, we're going to get back to the idea of functions. Oh, when I'm ready to end my multi-line comment, I have to do that. That ends my multi-line comment, so now my text is not colored green. That green text may be difficult for you all to see, so I'm going to do that configure idle thing, go to the highlights, find the string, See if I can change the color a little bit to something darker. You don't have to do this. Yeah, whatever. My new theme name. All right. There. A little bit darker. I don't know if it's easy to read or not. Okay. So what that part of the assignment was is it defined a function in the shell, and then you tried a couple of different ways to invoke it. And so some people had some problems with it. I hope this was a better, or that this was adequate explanation for that. I'm going to go back to our online text. I think most people are done typing here. And I always upload all these notes. So you're not absolutely obliged to type in all the comments, but it may burn it into your brain. So not to discourage y'all from doing it. Anybody need any more time? Type, 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 type. All right. 
All right, so we were in Chapter 2, Order of Operations. We are pretty much familiar with Order of Operations. I'm going to switch over to Notepad now. Order of Operations, also known as Precedence, just says that multiplication happens before you know addition, and so on. In the order, I think we talked about it, P-M-D-A-S, parentheses, followed by exponents, followed by multiplication and division, which have the same priority, followed by addition and subtraction. And multiplication and division also include floor division, which is the double slash, and star star. No, wait, star star is exponents. All right, so P is parentheses. We know what that is. E is exponents. It's star star. Now, some people want to type that as exponents, including me, because that's what we did in, you know, when we were typing in math or whatever. Um, I haven't seen a language yet that actually uses that symbol. Wish they did. So don't do that. Or if you do do it, you're going to find out that it doesn't work. And so MD is multiplication, division, also floor division which just means round down, and modulus. Modulus means remainder. And then you have addition and subtraction. I'm going to assume we understand that. If you don't, let me know. Send a text to me saying, hey, I wish you'd talked more about that. You know, if you do this, A, why did it no longer let me type? You're going to freeze on me? Neat. Ah, now it's back, right? Nope. Alrighty, I hope you all enjoy typing that. Uh, hmm. What's the word? I've never seen Notepad do that. All right. Right click, close window. Yeah, sure, let's save them if it lets me. Good deal. Hey, now my favorites are here. Alrighty. That's your C notes. They're not there. Oh well. Pim dash. <laughs> know it. So if A is equal to 3 and B is equal to 10, and so if you do X is equal to A star star, B minus 5 times 2, and we're supposed to figure out what that is. Well, we have to do the parentheses first, then we look inside the parentheses. We have an expression here. What happens first? Multiplication or division? Well, the multiplication happens first. So as we're thinking this through, 5 times 2 becomes 10. I did not really mean to take something to the zeroth power. <laughs> so, whatever. You know how to do that. And by the way, anything to the power of zero is one. Just kind of an odd little fact. There's a mathematical proof for it. All right. B minus four times two. All right. So four times two is eight. Ten minus eight is two. Three to the power of two is three times three, which is nine. So if we printed out X up to that point, we would get nine. I should make a little worksheet of those. Make sure you all know it but I'm hoping you do. And modulus means remainder. Pretty sure we know how that works. If you do x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 2 and then you print x mod y, well 10 divided by 2 is 5. Does 
Is that an even division? Is there anything left over? The answer is no. Ten, 2 goes into 10 cleanly with no remainder. So this would print out 0. What if it was 11, though? 11 divided by 2 is 5, but there's a remainder, a remainder of 1, not 1 half. There was 1 left over, so this would print out 1. So if we do 1 mod 3, 4, okay, fine, I'll look at that. 2 mod 4, 3 mod 4, 4 mod 4, and, uh, and 5 mod 4. Well, 4 goes into 1 0 times with a remainder of what? 1, right? And then 2 mod 4. 4 goes into 2 0 times with a remainder of? Did I hear 0? That's not correct. 4 goes into 2 0 times with a remainder of? 1. Yeah, we'll keep guessing. No, I'm kidding. 4 goes into 2 0 times, but what was left over? Right? Here's how to think about it. 4 minus, excuse me, 2 minus 0 is what? 2. So that's a remainder of 2. 4 goes into 3 how many times? 0 with a remainder of 3. And so 4 goes into 4 how many times? 1 with a remainder of 0. Right, right. Now, we, now, now we're cooking. And so 4 goes into 5 one time with a remainder of 1. And so on. You can use this to divvy up. I'll give you an example of something that you could use for. I guess I'll keep typing in c2.py. Did I remove the, uh, yeah, I commented that stuff out from c.py. So here's what I'm going to say. Say we have a lot of pigs. We have. 375 pennies. What we can do is dollars is equal to 3 to pennies floor division 100 because there's 100 pennies and a dollar. And then the cents is what is left over, right? I mean, we, we could figure this out in our head. If you have 375 pennies and you try to turn it into cash, you're going to get $3 out of it with 75 pennies left over. So that would be pennies modulus 100. Now when we print those values out, dollars is going to be 3 and cents is going to be 75. How about pounds and ounces? We have 100 ounces for some reason. Pounds, LB, is equal to 100 divided by 16. Better use floor division, though, because we want it rounded down to a whole number. So 100 floor division, 16. Round it down. And then OZ, the leftover ounces, is equal to 100 mod 16. Now, I can't do that in my head. So I'm going to print out. LB and an OZ, just because I'm curious about what that really, make sure that that kind of works. And maybe I'll print out the dollars and cents as well. So I'm going to hit up arrow a couple of times and under cents is equal to pennies, I'm going to do print dollars, comma, cents. And this is going to be nicely formatted with decimal points and dollar signs? No, it's not. So when I run it, Here's what I see. Oh, root is not defined. That's because I forgot to change it back to from C import star. So I scroll back up to the top of the code if you get the same error and change it back to from C import star. And that reminds me that I better pause the recording and walk about, make sure I haven't lost y'all. All right, now let's see if this works. All right. So 375 pennies was $3.75. 100 ounces was 6 pounds and 4 ounces left over. Hope that makes sense.
If you need to do more than two things, like if you need to get it into dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, it's not quite this easy. But if you're just taking it to two things, if you're taking it into one unit and then left over the other unit, that works. Let's pause. All right, I stored that number to that variable, but then I went ahead and used that number. That was kind of dumb. Replace those 100s with the word ounces. All I did is a copy and paste. So fix that. And if you typed, if you're getting an error right there, it's probably because you typed 1B. That's not going to work. It's supposed to be LB. LBS is an abbreviation for pounds. So I'm going to delete that and make it back to LB. So string operations. The plus sign is a valid operator for strings. What it does is so-called concatenation. Also, you could think of it as appending. If we do print first plus second, rather than separate it with commas. Oh, these are numbers. So plus sign just does addition for numbers. But when they are strings, it concatenates them. It appends one to the other. If I go to idle and I open up my shell, run Python shell, I'm going to close that window because it's getting pretty messy and open it again, run Python shell. If I do this, Hello, whoopsie, quote, high, end quote, plus, quote, Bob, it prints high Bob. It appended the text Bob to high. And yeah, I didn't use the word print, but that's via the magic of the shell. It evaluates it and dumps its contents to the screen. If this was actually going to be in the PY file, then I would put print in front of it or store it in a variable. So if I print, well, let's do Click define a couple of variables. A is equal to high. B is equal to Bob. C is equal to A plus B. And then print C. Prints high Bob. It concatenated them. Now here's something that Python does that I've never seen another language do, which is you can use the asterisk as well. Is an operator. The way that works is if I do this, print parentheses 10 times B, it goes nuts. Bob, 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 Bob. What it does is it appends Bob to itself 10 times. So we have 10 copies of that expression inside the Bob variable now. Now I've really almost never used that. The only time I've used it is if I want to print like a line of asterisks. I could do print quote asterisk, that's a star, times 80, and it's going to print, and that's an asterisk right there as well, times 80, and it's going to print a row of 80 asterisks. And that's about the only time I've ever used the, uh, the multiply operator involving strings. Now, if you're going to use multiply, then they both have to be of the same type. You can't, mul no, no. The, you, one of them has to be a string and one of them has to be a number, right? Because you can't do this. Hi times, quote, Bob. That doesn't work, right? You could do hi plus Bob and it'll append Bob to hi. But if you do hi times Bob, that doesn't mean anything. It would be have to beat high times 3 or high times 10, or if this was a variable, a numeric variable, that would work. What it's telling us here is that you can't multiply the sequence, which is that, by non-int of type string. What it's letting us know is that you can only multiply by an integer in this case. So asking the user for input. We'd like to be able to ask the user for something and then be able to, you know, do some math with it. Something. 
You use the input statement for that. I'm going to close my shell. I'm going to go back to c2.py. And instead of saying pennies is equal to 375, maybe I'm going to ask for the number of pennies. But annoyingly, I'm going to have to convert it to a number. Why? Well, let's find out. Tell you what. What if we, um, before I do all that stuff with the input, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to run it, and I'm going to find out that that's an error. Boom, it blows up. Unsupported operand types for blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? Well, this is a string. You can't do floor division with a string, right? You can't divide because this string could contain anything. It could contain the Declaration of Independence or my name or, you know, whatever. It makes no sense to try to do math with a string. We've seen that addition does something and that multiplication does something, but not something that you can use math for. So if that was the case, if we really had a string there and we wanted to do math with it, we would have to convert it first. We would have to convert it to a number, either to an int or a float. Let's convert it to a float. So after that line, we would do pennies is equal to float, parentheses, pennies, if I can spell correctly. This takes this variable, and it reformats it to be a floating point number. And we can do math on floating point numbers. I say that. Let me run it and make sure I don't get any syntax errors. Yeah, it still worked. $3.75. Why did I bother showing that to you? Because if you use the input function, it always returns a string. If you've taken a Java course, you may be used to asking the user to type in input, and then you'll get an integer out of it if you call an extent. And if you've taken a C++ course, you're used to using the arrow arrows, and it'll give you an integer or a float. Not in this language. Input always gives you a string, so you always have to convert it to a number if you're going to do math on it. Now, if you're asking for somebody's name, you're not going to try to do a conversion on it, right? Because you can't convert someone's name to a number. So I'm going to replace that 375 with an input call. Now, this is going to work, but it's going to be dumb. It's going to look like the program is frozen. So when I run it, it sits there and it says done. Well, you know what? I need to go up and I need to remove that print done statement. Anyways, it's sitting there waiting for me to type something, and I don't know that. But I'm going to type in something just to get past that part of the program, and then it finishes running. So uh, a couple of things I want to do. You see that print statement there that we had up there? Delete it or cut it and paste it at the bottom of your code, something like that. I'm going to take that print done. I'm going to cut it just because it's deceptive. And I'm going to come down here and paste it. All right. Now when I run it, at least it won't say done. But it's still waiting for me to type in something, and I have no idea. I did not prompt the user. I'm going to prompt the user. I'm going to put a string inside the input statement that tells them what they should type. Not two vertical bars. Two quotes. And in here, I'm going to ask them how many pennies do you have? Question mark. And I like putting a space at the end of that. I'll take the space out and show you why. Now when I run it, it's actually going to print that message and I know what I'm supposed to type. How many pennies do you have? Now since I don't have a space there before the quote, I don't have a space here in my output. I'm going to modify it to put that space in. I just think it's a little bit cleaner. All right, how many pennies do you have, question mark, space, end quote. That'll make me a little happier. All right, how many pennies do you have, question mark. And now I can type in that I have, you know, 987 pennies. And it's going to tell me that I have $9 in 80s. Yeah, but look at that. It's giving me $9.0 and 87.0 cents. That's kind of lame. I could fix that, though. Instead of converting it to a float, the reason we're getting all that stuff is because 
We're doing math on a floating point number because we converted our input to a float. Instead, I'm going to convert it to an int. <coughs> I'm going to change that word float there to int. Now when I type I have 105 pennies, it tells me I have $1.05. Should I change this print statement so it conveys more useful information like dollars and cents? Yeah, I should. I'm not going to bother. Another demonstration would be converting minutes to hours and minutes. What would my magic number be if I was doing hours from minutes. Wouldn't it be 16 or 100? 60, 60. It'd be 60, right, because we have 60 hours. Excuse me, we have 60 minutes in an hour. This here is demonstrating that if you embed a backslash in, and the backslash is the one near the inner key, not under the question mark, then it'll skip a line. So, down here, I'm just going to prove that point. Print I backslash N. My keyboard is weird. Backslash should be above the inner key, but it's not. All righty. Love backslash N Python. Exclamation point. End quote. Close parentheses. Now, whenever I do a code example that has an input statement, I get pretty tired of it asking me every single time I test the code. Oh, well. Anyways, here we see it saying, I love Python. And that slash in is known as a new line character. It told it to go to the next line of text, just like hitting enter on a keyboard. Can be useful. The problem with this call here, pennies is equal to int pennies, is that if they are naughty dogs and type in something other than an integer, it's going to blow up. And I'll show you what I mean. I run. How many pennies do you have? Gee, I don't know. Right? And then it blows up. Now, obviously, that was not going to work. Right? I typed a string. That string could not be converted into a number. But what if I type in a number, but it has a decimal point in it? I might think that this should be valid input, 600.0. No. Once we had that .0 on there, it's treated as though it's a floating point number, and that int function will not convert a floating point number into an integer. There's a couple things we could do to try to fix that. I'm going to show you this. I'm not expecting everybody to m have it memorized. Nah, I'm not going to show it. We'll get back to that idea later. All right, we've already seen comments. As your programs get bigger and more complicated, they're difficult to read. It's a good idea to add notes. The comments are like penciling in stuff on the margins of your textbook to try to give yourself an idea of what it's doing. So here's this equation right there. So we put a comment in front of it to explain that equation. Compute the percentage of the hour that has elapsed. Now this is kind of stupid. This is a little bit redundant. Assign 5 to V. You already know that it's doing that. So you can get ridiculous with your comments. You don't have to put a comment on every single line of code. Now for the space you know, program in the 1960s, the uh, computer code that controlled the space modules that landed on the moon. Yes, they did comment every single line. But that's because they weren't written in an easy to understand language like Python. They were written in assembler. Assembler is a very terse programming language. Let me give you an example of that. I 
should have called it. Yeah. So here we go. Here's a better example. Oh, for Pete's sake. All right, anyways, here's a, a better example. Hopefully it won't be black on black. All right. This is what a symbol assembly looks like. Every chip has to have a different version of assembly, so you can be sure that the space program was not programming to Intel chips at the time. But this sub-32 is defining a function. And then there's some statements here. Compare these two numbers. Jump if the result was less than something. Compare these two numbers. Jump if something was greater than something. A jump statement is like go to. It tells it to go to a specific line number. Except we're not using line numbers. We're using labels. We have this label here. We have this label here. See, without this stuff, if this is covered up and I looked at this, I would not be able to explain what it was doing. Yeah, I've seen assembly before, so I would know, kind of, I could still explain it. But you can see that this is real terse. It doesn't look like Python at all. And so every single line of code in this example was documented. And if you're writing more complex code than this, this is trivial assembler, actually. Usually it takes, you know, hundreds of lines of assembler to do something useful. If, if whatever you do in like five lines of code in Python might take a hundred lines in a similar or more. What do people use a similar for? Not so much anymore. I say that. If you're writing something that's supposed to directly control a piece of hardware and it needs to run in the absolute minimum amount of space and with maximal speed, it might get written in a similar. But it's very difficult to maintain looks like that so that it would more likely be written <coughs> in C or C++ most likely C C is a small enough language that it still runs very efficiently all right choosing good variable names which they call mnemonic uh, which I pronounce mnemonic mnemonic variable names Single-letter variable names don't tell you very much about what the purpose of them is. Right, if I look at some code and I see A is equal to 35 and B is equal to 12.5 and C is equal to A times B in print C, that's fine for a programming example in class. But if I open up a Python file and I see that line of code, I'm not going to try, I'm not going to know. You know, I see the values, but I don't know what they mean. A lot more meaningful if we give them good names. Hours is equal to 35. Rate is equal to 1250. Pay is equal to hours times rate. All right, so these are good variable names. Now, variable names are arbitrary. You don't have to give them good names. You can give them absurd names. This is valid code. The only difference in these variable names is that there's an H there and there's an F there. And anyways, so this is very difficult to understand. There'd be no reason for you to do this. This is what you want to aim for. Now, in class, I'm going to sometimes use single-letter variable names just because they're easy for us to type. But in your code, you pretty much want to use something that's more than a single letter. You want it to be meaningful. I'm skipping a section called debugging. Debugging is incredibly important, but it's also kind of a learned something you learn by practice when you're doing your homework. So I shouldn't skip it. I'm going to close this C.py. I haven't made any changes to it in a long time, so I'm going to save it. I'm leaving C2.py up. If I make a mistake, it doesn't always show me the correct line that the error is. For example, if I remove this double quote here, and then I run it, it's not going to necessarily, well, it did. It told me that the line was, the problem was there. But sometimes it says that the line is on the line, the problem is on the line above it. You just have to kind of get used to interpreting the error messages. You study them real long, and yeah, they're written in, you know, what looks like Greek to us, EOL, while scanning string literal. 
What that means is that it hit the end of the line while I was looking. This is supposed to be a string. And this is a literal, which is something that's enclosed in double quotes. And what do you know? It's not enclosed in double quotes. There's no terminating quote, right? You have to have a pair of quotes whenever you define a string. So that's my problem. And if I put my parentheses there, that going to fix it? Oh, it looks good to me. I'm going to run it. I'm going to get another error. What did I do wrong there? Close the parentheses. Yeah, I did close the parentheses. It looks like they're closed, but they're not. And check it out. When I ran it, it didn't show me the right air, um, the right line, right? Invalid syntax. I could stare at this all day long and not know while print why this is an error. So after you look at what it highlights, if you can't figure it out, scroll up to the line above it and see if there's a problem in it. And in this case, the problem is that there's no closing parentheses. Why is that? Because everything inside the quotes is considered part of the string. There was no closed parentheses. So I'm putting the parentheses back. Now it's going to run. All right. We are at the end of that chapter. Glossary, concatenating. Puts strings one after the other. We saw that. We used the plus symbol. A comment. We know what a comment is. It's a note written in the source code. You either put a hash symbol or you put, you know, quote, quote, quote. Other languages use different comment symbols. C and C++ and Java use slash slash. Evaluate to simplify an expression by performing the operations in order to yield a single value. Well, when I did that, you know, a to the power of, and then we had a parentheses, I was evaluating it in my head. And the computer does the same thing. The expression, an expression is a series of variables, a combination of variables, operators, and values that gets evaluated to a single value. Right, so if we do A is equal to B times 4, B times 4 is evaluated and then stored into A. Floating point is a number with a decimal point. An integer is a number without a decimal point. Even if the decimal point is just 0, .0 that still makes it a floating point number. The keyword, a reserved word, used by the compiler. It's part of the language. We can't use that word for our own purposes. We can only use it for what its purposes are. So for example, well the compiler idle highlights all the keywords in orange. I don't have very many keywords in this yet, but the word from is a keyword. The word import is a keyword. The word def, def is a keyword. Things like if and while, all of those are keywords. So if I did something dumb like this, while is equal to 10 because I think I'm creating a variable called while, that's a syntax there and it won't, won't run. You can't use keywords as variable names. You can use function names as variable names, but it ruins the function. Like if I went up to the top here and I said that print is equal to 72, that's not a syntax error. But later on, when we try to print some stuff out, we start getting error messages. I have erased in its memory what print is. It's no longer a function, it's just an integer. So the editor colorizes things in order to try to help us avoid making mistakes like that. When I'm creating a variable, it better be black. Better not be purple, better not be orange. A mnemonic, a memory aid. We try to give our variables good names to help us remember what is stored in the variable. You want your code to be as easy to understand as possible. You want it to be to read almost like, you know, English text. And that works if you give your variables good names. Modulus, we know what modulus means. Operand. Operand is the values that the operators work on. That's my operator right there, which means that 1 and 4 are my operands. Rules of precedence, the order in which expressions are evolved, not evolved, evaluated. A statement is a command in the code. 
In this language, they are usually a single line of code. A string is a series of characters enclosed in quotes. The type is the data type. Ints, floats, and strings are the type that we've seen so far. And values are what gets stored in those variables. And a variable is a named place in memory that can contain a value. All right, exercise. I think my homework is good enough, and I'm not going to give you any of these exercises. All right, I think we're about done. I'm going to end now so that if anybody wants to hang out for a few minutes afterwards and ask questions about homework, we can do that. Let's make a Dropbox.